All right, Augie, it's winter. I don't like the cold. Why is that? It makes my trouser turn up shrink the size of a reason. I won't stand here and let you blame the cold, you liar. If you would be in the desert right now, everyone would be thinking your pants caught leprosy. You can't blame my guy for trying. I will blame you for a lot of things, including the stench of failure in this backyard. However, today is a special holiday episode about the Olympus Prime Lenses. In a cold night, some filmmakers like outdoor filming a lot. However, certain Micro Four Thirds users strangely do not. The reason for that is most of all that a cheap bastard's wallet is two sizes too small. However, your problem will be solved with the best native prime lenses that Micro Four Thirds has to offer. For starters, all three lenses have an easy autofocus to manual focus pull switch, enabling you a hard stop for manual focus. The lenses are as durable as Mrs. Claus's liquor cabinet, being made out of metal and high-end plastics. Furthermore, all lenses have the same size of filter thread of 62mm. One thing to keep in mind, aperture is controlled through the camera only. What makes those Olympus Prime lenses so great? Well, they are weather sealed and freeze resistant, while having the bright aperture of f1.2. Also, the autofocus has minimal pulsing compared to the Lumix lenses that are as erratic in autofocus as an out-of-shape university student with blue hair. The physical size of them is virtually identical to the Olympus Pro 12-40mm f2.8. The 45 and 25mm were released first, while the 17mm was released at a later date. They have no internal stabilization. However, you should invest in a gimbal anyways. The 25 and 45 mm are made in Japan, while the 17 mm is made in Vietnam. Is there a quality difference? Well, the 17 mm feels lighter, although it might be just the fact that it's a wide angle. One thing that is, however, different is the resistance when you manual focus. The 17 mm doesn't have that much resistance, while the 25 and 45 has a noticeable amount more. However, other than the weight and focus resistance, there is no difference. The following footage has been shot with a 17mm f1.2. In full frame terms, this is a 34mm f2.4. On my GH5S sensor, it's more like a 31mm f2.2. The image quality is very good, with its colors and rendering as natural as a 1970s nudist colony. And here's the party trick. The autofocus is not pulsing making transitions as relaxing as eggnog with the bonus gift card for another eggnog. The focus to autofocus transitions are gradual, which is a mark of a good lens. And here you get a prime example of its feathered bokeh. While being a marketing name, it's at least a very accurate description of the bokeh. Now we get to the 25mm f1.2. The following footage has been shot with 25mm. In full frame terms it's a 50mm f2.4, but on a GH5S it's an effective 45mm f2.2. Once again, it has the nice colors and rendering. Being a normal focal length, it might be a bread and butter lens for many filmmakers, since it looks great in many distances. Its autofocus is even smoother than the 17mm. The feathered bokeh is as feathery as a pillow fight between Mike Tyson and Don King. At f1.2, there's enough light to maintain a clean image. Now we get to the 45mm f1.2, a portrait lens if there ever has been one. The following footage has been shot with a 45mm. In full frame terms, it's a 90mm f2.4, but on the GH5S, it's an 81mm f2.2. If you have a bokeh addiction and it can only be solved with more bokeh, this is the lens for you. Cause, spatial rendering, and bokeh are very similar to the feel of full frame Zeiss classic lenses. Except with its smooth autofocus motors, it may be sharper than classics due to its focus target acquisition. As you can see, the footage of all three lenses remains consistent, making them the perfect lens set for any occasion. In a legal sense, of course. So, I give him my present. 
Then she slapped it right out of my hands and told me to fuck off and freeze to death. Well, the holiday season makes people very emotional, especially when they're social workers. Yes, that's the nicest she has ever been to me. Now we get to see the lenses at different distances, starting with the wide angles and starting with the 17mm. No major distortions other than the mangled genome that produced Augie's face. Even though it's wide open, not much pokey blur at that distance. At 25mm I was a bit too far away, but what do you want, it's cold. Only deers enjoy this weather. Unless you have fur on your nuts, this is an easy street. At that focal length, it's a very close approximation on how our human eyes perceive space. At 45mm the lens makes sure to highlight the subject to establish a dramatic poignant moment. The poignant moment in this shot is that Augie's jacket and sweater make him look like polar bear poo with corn sticking out of it. Time to go to the medium torso shot. The 17mm wide open has decent bokeh for subject separation. Nothing crazy, but it does the job. Autofocus is on face tracking and as you can see there is no obnoxious pulsing like Lumix lenses. Then again, that's why it's around 1400 Canadian dollars. At a similar price range, the 25mm does its magic as well. It's even less pulsing than the 17mm, showing Augie looking like a nutcracker who broke off his wood while losing his nuts. At 45mm there is barely any pulsing. It takes the face tracking longer to establish a lock, so keep that in mind with longer focal length. At that distance the bokeh resembles a full frame 50mm f1.4, so would you even need it more blurry than that for video? Now we're in the medium close distance. As you go closer, the pulsing becomes less, since the subject separation acquisition becomes easier for the autofocus. That is, as long as you have enough light. Again, at 17mm everything looks clean. At 25mm no obvious pulsing can be detected. The viewer's attention is fully on Augie, who looks like a disgruntled ice troll that misplaced his only rhubarb. But Olympus lenses have a nice attribute, in that they render skin tones pleasant while remaining sharp. 45mm should make it very clear. The blurry pleasant stuff in the back is the bokeh. The sharp item in the front is the sweater. The hideous grimace in the center is Augie's face with good skin tones. If this would be Sigma, the bokeh would be awkward, the sweater would be 2D and the skin would look like an ogre's toenail. Now we get to lens flares. All three lenses come with lens hoods. However, you can't use them with the ND filter attached. Lens flares are all very consistent on all three lenses across the board. It is very controlled. As you go higher in focal length, you see more of the flare shapes. Then again, it's because the image is closer, so that can be expected. But it gives you some control of how much you want to use of the flare and how much you don't. However, how do the lens motors perform when the subject in focus is actually moving around? And what aperture works best for tracking? Let's start with a 17mm f1.2. We have Augie walk towards the camera like a downtrodden failure who has to submit his PayPal account to look at women. He's a big believer in dress for the life you want, not the one you have. And hopefully he can afford a PayPal account next year. As you can see, the tracking is fairly consistent and gradual focus motor not having sudden jolts like an epileptic peeping tom. It makes a powerful argument not to buy adapted full frame lenses that are autofocus, since they simply cannot compare with the autofocus of premium native micro four thirds lenses like the Olympus. Also the motor is fairly silent sounding, not like the toys that the elves make for Mrs. Claus's night table. Then again, at wide angles, the focus motors wouldn't be very drastic. At f2, again everything looks great, with the exception of the contorted figure we all know as Augie. Still no major pulsing, and I have seen more insecure focus pulling from full frame Lumix cameras, so again, quite satisfactory for a Lumix camera. At f2.8 you are getting the same consistent results. I would say just stick with the wide open, since it operates fantastic. Plus keep in mind, when you put a camera on a gimbal, any minor pulsing would not be detectable with the human eye due to the spatial movement. Also this is a very small lens and all things considered keeping your gear light. Is this lens the perfect gimbal lens? Is Santa Baby the national anthem for gold diggers? Yes on both accounts. Now we come to the 25mm f1.2 wide open. We can see that the focus has a bit of a harder time to face track Augie than the 17mm. Looking at Augie's head, you can't blame it, but such is life. The focus and consistency is actually quite good if you maintain a medium distance. However, once you are too far away or too close, the focus is starting to be a bit laggy. As laggy as a gaming PC put together by a drunk elf. 
it's not a big issue, but you have to make sure not to come too close too fast, or have the actor too far away where now it won't focus on the subject. At F2, things look different with focus already being quite consistent at further distances and close-ups. I would probably say that if your actor doesn't move fast, F1.2 is fine. However, if there is more faster movement through the dimensions, F2 might be the more balanced option if you don't mind sacrificing a little bit of bokeh. Again, it all depends on the shots and how you block the movement with the actor. However, regardless what aperture there is, no strong pulsing. And I could repeat my rant that once you move around with your gimbal, any small pulsing won't be noticeable. At f2.8 it's decent, but the focus seems to be more accurate at f2. Uh, look at Augie walk. In this season, ladies of the night also know Augie as Tiny Tim with a withered limb, or Mr. Scratchet with a stubby hatchet, or Ebenezer with a tiny squeezer. In other words, pimps slap him over the head for wasting everyone's time. Interestingly, you could potentially waste time if you shoot a lot of f2.8, since then you could just buy the Olympus 12-40mm f2.8 Pro zoom lens. Granted, the primes would still have a better image, but you would save 50% of costs. As for the 45mm f1.2 wide open, it takes a while for the autofocus to acquire the target by itself if you don't tap it yourself. But once it's locked and the subject isn't moving too fast, it's quite good. If you're standing out too close, the lens will have issues acquiring target. And again, let me be clear, the subject should not be moving fast. Noticeably, the focus motors are not as quick as the 17 and 25mm. It is a focal length issue, seen especially on the 45 to 150mm Olympus Pro Zoom. Its focus motors are slow enough that it could qualify for a government pension. So in comparison, the 45mm Prime doesn't seem so bad. At F2, the result is as interesting as an enigma wrapped in a question surrounded by a quizzes accompanied with a cheat sheet that makes you win a pizza. My point is that at this aperture, the focus transition looks almost perfect. F2 seems to be the Goldilocks setting for autofocusing on all three lenses. I assume it has more detail for the contrast to detect the subject, but the background is still blurry enough that the autofocus won't hunt around in the background. Also F2 is a full frame equivalent of F4. In other words, industry standard in bokeh. So you really don't have to go blurrier than that, unless you're desperate hiding hideous backgrounds. Bokeh, in a way, is to improve a certain look, admittingly. However, to improve Augie's look, one needs a plastic bag over his head, preferably sealed, with the wrinkles ironed out using a baseball bat. After hearing this, you're probably offended, because plastic bags are not environmentally friendly. But relax, nerd, one would use a wooden bat to compensate. Having said all that, f2.8 is as good as f2. This being an 81mm full frame equivalent, the background is still blurry enough that the autofocus won't hunt in the back. But one has to keep in mind, this is all considering you have enough light. Once it's too dark, the focus will hunt around on all three lenses, like a 30 year old geek shopping at a toy store for action figures on Christmas Eve for himself. Augie has action figures as well. They're not very high-end, since he makes them out of twigs and batteries that kids throw at his head. Perfectly understandable, I think. After all, his face looks like as if Jack Frost took a dump on it after eating lopsided ice cubes. In a matter of fact, Augie is so ugly every time he enters a haunted house, he comes out with a paycheck. When he's inside a bank, they have to switch off the security cameras. Every time he has a dentist appointment, they make him lie face down. My point is, he's not a handsome fellow. Nevertheless, let's look at how smooth the autofocus is by tapping on the screen. First we start with a 17mm wide open. Well, I would not call it gradual or smooth, it's as subtle as sitting on a crushed tree ornament. The 25mm wide open on the other hand is much smoother with the transitions. Most likely the longer the lens the less jaggy it is. However, at 45mm, while well, it's gradual, on speed it seems more hectic as the 25mm. That might just be that at 45mm the contrast between bokeh and non-bokeh is quite large, and the focus just snaps back. 
But what about manual focus? Well, focusing manually is very easy on all three lenses. The focus pull resistance is what I can describe as very comparable to the focus pull of the Zeiss Jenna Flectagon 35mm f2.4. It's enough resistance to make it controllable, though they don't have the long focus pull of the Flectagon. I should also mention, all three Olympus lenses have minimal lens breathing. If lens breathing is important to you, these lenses should make you giddy. Then again, if you overly care about lens breathing, you have other problems. Alright, so let's take a look at the bokeh from close-ups. We start with a 17mm. Obviously, the bokeh is very smooth while it's open, but also at f2 and f2.8, there are still no octagonal shapes in the bokeh balls. f2.8 being a full-frame equivalent of f5, on the GH5S 1.8 crop, you will not have to be concerned about distracting bokeh stopping down. Same story with the 25mm, as creamy as a melting frosty the snowman who has been hit with a muscle relaxant. Now some of you might say, Weird filmmaker, these lenses are too expensive. For half the price I could get a Mikey Cine lenses for a micro four thirds. Or for one third the price I could even get Olympus f1.8 lenses. First of all, that's the reason why Santa's elves laugh at your package. Second of all, you rent micro four thirds to save money. And now you're screwed when lighting is low or everything looks a bit flat. If you're staying with the Micro Four Thirds system, you should compensate by getting the best lenses for the system that you can reuse when you update the camera bodies. You're going to cheap out again on your primary lens? Is there a particular reason you didn't want to upgrade your cell phone and just use that for filming? Yeah, it doesn't have good bokeh, just like your MFT camera and El Cheapo lenses. But at least a filmmaker on a budget who uses a cell phone is honest. Instead of skimping on the camera, skimping on the lens, and then paying 200 bucks on a matte box and two ND sheets of glass just so it looks great on social media. You're aware you could buy a variable ND photo filter for your El Cheapo lens. That is much more efficient and higher quality, right? It screws right onto the lens thread. But I guess it doesn't matter if your boom mic only runs on mono. My point is, budget filmmaking doesn't mean you have to run on quantity gear. Nor are you saving money long term. Lenses with electronics inside would have to be weather sealed and dustproof if you want to use them for years to come. And if you're getting a manual lens, you should invest in a speed booster and full frame glass. Don't get the entry level cinema glass that is as inviting as a mistletoe belt buckle on Jabba the Hutt. You also don't want to be the YouTube reviewer who says, I have three 25mm lenses, but I can't afford the Olympus Pro one right now. Now for the few photographers who are still watching for whatever reason, here are some photo samples of all three lenses. I used the Lumix G9 on natural mode. I actually have used all three lenses on model shoots in the past. And I can see why those lenses are considered for professionals. The autofocus is virtually instant. You focus the moment you press the button and take the shot. Image quality rivals the premium full frame lenses. And if you're a professional photographer, you would be dense not to buy these. Now, while well, these are photography lenses, enough talk about photo stuff. So, how would these lenses perform shooting a cinematic scene? A scene so thrilling and exciting that network TV would have to censor it? Well, wonder no more. Hello? Listen closely, you don't know me. I know your little secret you want to keep quiet. It happens to be that I watched everything behind a grassy knoll. So I want 50 million dollars deposited in a Swiss bank account. And maybe... Uh, also a Ferrari. Understand? Sir, I think you have the wrong number. Are you sure? Yes, this is a pizzeria. Okay, listen. I want a large pizza with triple cheese and mushrooms. Large pizza with triple cheese and mushrooms. It will be 35.78 before tax. 
And no cheese? There will be eighteen dollars twenty-six. What can I get for two dollars and ninety-five cents? Does that include tip? Yes, it does. Is that Canadian or U.S. coins? Canadian. Hmm. I have to check with my manager if we sell half a breadstick. I will put you on hold. So, should you buy the Olympus Pro Prime 17mm f1.2? Well, yes. Are you dense? It's the best native Prime 17mm lens on the entire Micro Four Thirds system. And what can I say about Olympus Pro Prime 25mm f1.2? Same story as the 17mm. It's the best there is. There's an updated version too of the Leica 25mm f1.4, but it's not as bright and has the Lumix lens pulsing. The Voigtlander 25mm 0.95 again isn't weather sealed and has no autofocus. And now the Olympus Pro Prime 45mm f1.2. Once again, if you get anything else, it will be worse. The closest comparator is the Leica 42.5mm f1.2. It's not weather sealed, and you can expect some kind of Lumix pulsing going on. And I should mention that both the Leica 25mm and 42.5mm, while having good image quality, doesn't look as organic or natural as the Olympus glass. At the end of the day, image quality should matter too, even if you are a spec sheet geek. So, this concludes why these are the best prime lenses for Micro Four Thirds. Alright, Augie, it's the season. So I got you something. Your present is right over there. It's a pair of underpants I found frozen at a bus stop. You can probably imagine why the gentleman chose to throw them out. I want you to take a good look at it, Augie, since it's an existential metaphor of what your place is in society. In short, you're the pimple on humanity's armpit. But wait, there's more. I have another gift for you. But in order to receive it, you have to smell the frozen underpants for a clue to guess what it is. No, you have to take a bigger whiff. No, much bigger. Do you want the present or not? That's the way to do it. So, can you guess what you got? No, I can't. Hepatitis B. You are hideous, Mr. Augie. Your face I want to hit. Blow the belt you have a raisin, and your brain is filled with shit, Mr. Augie. You burger bunny dick bastard who looks like Wimple Steel Skin after botched plastic surgery.